King of glory, chosen heir to witness for his name. Far and wide we tell the Father's story, far and wide his love proclaim. Onward, ever onward, as we glory in his name. I'm Nancy Waddell. We've prepared this video series to help good missionaries become better ones, to help potential missionaries be better prepared, and to help every member of the church be more successful in missionary efforts and interpersonal relationships. Most of these principles involve just good old common sense. But what's common sense for one person may not come so easily for another. Most of our missionaries are so impressive. We really trust their abilities and judgment. But occasionally we see a few that are just a little lax in presenting that sharp missionary image. We love the missionaries and we really want them to be successful. But sometimes they do some things and, and we feel like we need to give them a suggestion just to help them be more effective. In this video series, we'll be looking at ourselves through the eye of a camera to see ourselves as others may see us. We hope you'll examine yourself to determine what advice is appropriate for you to make you the most effective missionary and person you can be and to make a difference in your relationship with others. This series is divided into seven topics. Video one deals with building credibility, that quality which attracts people to us and to our message. Our second video is on table manners. As a missionary, practicing proper table manners may have more impact on your work than you realize. Video three is appearance and social skills. Being our best self, both in appearance and actions, is the essence of the gospel and of missionary work because it determines how people first judge us. Video four, visual poise, will help sister missionaries be more confident in teaching and social situations. Other topics we'll discuss are care of clothing, fitness and nutrition, and care and maintenance of your apartment. We hope as you view these videos and use the optional workbook, you'll learn skills to help you feel even more sure of yourself so that you can more easily forget yourself and turn out to focus on serving others. As missionaries, we have a great gift to share, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet if we present an image like this, we may not attract as many people as we could to hear our message. The quality which attracts people to us and to our message is called credibility. It's a very powerful missionary principle because it makes people want to hear our thoughts and our opinions. It means interacting with people in ways which cause them to trust you. As we improve our skills in interacting with people, we increase our credibility and our effectiveness. Credibility can be achieved in many ways, through increasing our gospel knowledge and insights, strengthening our spirituality, and sincerely, honestly caring about those around us. Credibility is also achieved in other ways, ways which may seem superficial, but which are actually very important. Simple courtesies like proper manners, proper dress and grooming, and appropriate interaction with our companions, our investigators, and with members. Let's look at a few principles of credibility which might help us as missionaries. First, nonverbal communication. 
Studies show that when we see someone for the first time, we make an initial judgment of that person, positive or negative, in the first three to five seconds. That judgment may quickly change after we talk with that person and get to know him or her. But the first impression is usually what makes us want to get to know someone better. In missionary work, that first impression communicates loud and clear without a word being said. The message we want to communicate is, I care. I care about myself and I care about you. And I'm here for an important reason. These messages are communicated through a professional look. That means proper dress, always neatly pressed and repaired if needed, as well as personal grooming and hygiene, essential to positive nonverbal communication. Reread church and mission policies with regards to dress and grooming. And don't forget a cheerful, radiant attitude. An image consultant once said, if I could teach women to use their thoughts as well as they do their powder puffs, I could truly make them beautiful. Whether you're a sister, elder, or member missionary, positive, faith-filled thoughts are essential to making a radiant countenance. And a genuine, sincere smile goes a long way, too. Another area crucial to credibility is good manners. We've all probably heard those two words dozens of times as young children. Yet nothing affects our relationship with others, for good or bad, quite like manners. A 19th century philosopher, Henry Drummond, put it this way, Politeness has been defined as love in trifles. Courtesy is said to be love in the little things. Proper etiquette, or good manners, is an important part of day-to-day -day missionary work because it helps you communicate love and concern, and it gives you a feeling of security in dealing with the people you meet. Having manners is simply being thoughtful towards others. It means never doing or saying something which will embarrass, belittle, or offend someone else. Good manners shouldn't be turned on when the front door opens, but should be an integral part of a missionary's daily life. And in the mission field, where does courtesy begin? With you and your companion, of course. As a missionary, you can set a tone of spirituality and commitment among all the missionaries with whom you work, especially your companion. Pray for each other, pull for each other, and seek for the Spirit in all that you do. A wise counselor once gave this advice, happy companionships are the result not of perfect living, but of two people who are experts at forgiving. Effective missionary work begins with a good relationship with your companion, which often begins with good old-fashioned manners. Always use soft, gracious tones with each other, as well as the words, thank you, please, I'm sorry, and what is your opinion? Avoid doing things which can be annoying, such as not cleaning up after yourself, being too bossy or opinionated, or being habitually late. Never make a belittling comment or say something you know would make your companion angry. And on the other hand, don't let yourself get offended. When we give in to tender feelings or allow ourselves to get hurt or angered easily, we're headed for trouble. Use good manners by keeping your apartments clean and orderly so they can be spirit-filled. Practice proper etiquette with your companion and other missionary associates so that when you're in social situations with members and investigators, your appropriate actions will come naturally and spontaneously. Be appropriate in elder-sister relationships. Friendships should be based on your love of the work and your testimony of the gospel, keeping an eye single to the glory of the Lord. Some guidelines for elder-sister relationships Comply strictly with mission rules. Never discuss personal problems with each other. Avoid excessive sympathy with an elder or sister's problems. Avoid discussing anything that is not mission business. Do nothing that could be considered flirtatious. Don't talk too often or too long to any one elder or sister. Don't assume a big sister or big brother role. 
Sisters, contact your landlord or mission office to correct maintenance problems instead of the elders. Elders, don't ask the sisters to cut your hair or sew on buttons. Again, reread church and mission rules and commit yourselves to them. Courtesy with members in your mission area will also greatly enhance your credibility. Develop a spiritual, not a social relationship with members. When visiting their homes for dinner, always share a spiritual message before leaving. Practice proper table manners. Detailed table etiquette is discussed in the video Table Manners. Express thanks for kindnesses and services. Short, simple thank you notes are always appropriate. Keep a blank note card in your appointment book. Then, before you leave a dinner appointment, slip a thank you note under a plate or on the counter. Don't become too casual with members. That means don't use the telephone without permission. Don't help yourself to the refrigerator or get a glass from the cupboard without permission. Be careful moving from room to room. Private areas in a home are closed to missionaries. Use appropriate conduct with children in the family. Avoid boisterous behavior. Be careful not to get them wound up or engage in activities that would detract from your dignity as a missionary. Avoid counseling members about their problems. Refer them to the bishop or branch president. Don't ever be alone without your companion with a member of the opposite sex. Be positive. Don't criticize church or community leaders. Avoid complaining about local religions, customs, or food. Be supportive and encouraging in helping motivate members to fulfill their missionary responsibilities. Don't chastise them for their lack of missionary work. And last, don't stay too long. Make visits brief but meaningful. When interacting with investigators, remember the tremendous power in showing love and caring. We show our concern by the way we act. Our manners and loving attitudes should only be extensions of what we practice daily with our companions and with members. When meeting an investigator, use good eye contact. Be alert and sensitive to both verbal and nonverbal messages. Don't chew gum anywhere in front of anybody. I had just been made ward mission leader when we introduced a new missionary at the ward. He was full of missionary zeal and enthusiasm, but unfortunately, none of the members remembered his wonderful testimony. They all remembered him as the missionary who chewed gum. When riding a bicycle or driving a car, be a good example by obeying all the laws. As a Mormon missionary, you're very visible and recognizable, especially on bikes. Don't be careless. Remember, bicyclists are subject to the same traffic rules as motorists. Being polite and courteous on a bike or in a car can do a great deal for the positive image of the church. The most effective and successful missionaries are those who willingly keep the rules, whether laws of the land or of the mission. Remember, whether in your apartment or in a public place, never do or say anything which would detract from the dignity of your calling as a missionary, as an ambassador of the Savior. Your appearance and your actions are vital to missionary work because the way you present yourself will determine how readily others will receive your message. As a missionary, practicing proper table manners may have more impact on your work than you realize. A 19th century newspaper editor in Boston once wrote, One knows the very nature of both man and woman by their actions at the table. One suddenly sees their innermost characters, their attitudes, their breeding, but above all, one knows whether one cares to spend another evening at the table with them. That statement may be a little strong, but the point is well taken. Table manners are important. Good manners show concern for others and sensitivity to people around you. Consider this experience of a mission president. We had a situation in our mission where a member family eagerly invited their friends to dinner to meet the missionaries and to win their desire to hear the gospel. But during the entire meal, 
the two elders ate with their mouths open and talked with their mouths full. In fact, one even ate his baked potato by spearing it and lifting the whole thing to his mouth. Unfortunately, after the elders left that evening, the non-members said they were not interested in hearing the gospel from the missionaries. Their comment was, if those two young men are not smart enough to know about basic manners, then why should we think they're smart enough to know about things of eternity? Poor table manners can be a deterrent to missionary work and can prevent us from gaining the approval and trust of members and investigators. Let's review some guidelines which will help us improve our table manners and social skills. First, don't be late for dinner appointments, but if you must be delayed, be sure to call. At the dinner table, we should be sensitive to those around us and eat so as to make it a pleasant experience, not only for ourselves, but for others as well. The two most universal styles of eating are continental or European style, with the fork in the left hand and the knife in the right. Fork tines are down and food is pushed onto the back of the fork with the knife before lifting the fork to the mouth. An American style, where you cut the food in the left hand, but before eating, you lay the knife down and change the fork to the right hand. Of course, left-handed people reverse which hands are used. Both styles are considered proper, but it's best to try to adapt to the style which is used most frequently in your area. When you approach the table, pause for a moment so the host or hostess can tell you where to sit, or if you aren't given directions, simply ask. Once you're seated, don't touch anything, even water or napkin, until the blessing is said. Then place your napkin on your lap, opening it entirely if it's lunch size, or leaving it half folded the long way if it's a large dinner size, with the fold placed closest to the waist. Don't begin eating until your host or hostess has begun. Be sure to sit straight in your chair and avoid tilting back. Use good posture. Bring food or drink up to your mouth rather than bending over to reach it. In choosing utensils, start from the outside working in. If there is a utensil above the plate, that's to be used for dessert. Hold the spoon or fork in a pencil position. Raise arms vertically so the elbow doesn't stick out in a wing fashion. And never put your knife in your mouth. Use it for cutting and spreading only. Pass food clockwise. Food is served on the right. In receiving food, take the dish from the server, set it on the table, and then serve yourself, unless the server offers to hold it for you. When asked for food, don't serve yourself first. Take small portions at first. There are usually second helpings. When jellies, sauces, or butter are served, place a small amount on your plate, not directly onto your roll or vegetable then pass them on. Jams, jellies, and butter should go on your bread plate, but if there is no bread or butter plate, then on the side of your main plate. When buttering bread or rolls, break off a small section, butter it and eat it, then go on to another section. Never butter an entire slice of bread all at once. Break it into small pieces not larger than a quarter of a slice. Never cut a roll. Always break it open with your fingers. If it is unusually hard or brittle, prick it gently with your fork and then break it with your fingers. This principle doesn't apply to cornbread or muffins. They may be cut. When offered a tray of fruit, finger foods, or crackers, take two or three items at a time. When eating soups or puddings, slide the spoon away from you and then back over the bowl to your mouth so any stray drop will fall into your bowl, not on your lap. When not eating, rest the soup spoon on the plate, or if there is no plate, then in the bowl is permissible. It's permissible to tip your bowl for the last bit, but always tip it away from you and continue to spoon away. Never drink soup or other liquids from the bowl, but if it is served in a cup, you may drink it from the cup. Don't blow on hot liquids to cool them. Test them with a small bit on your spoon, then let the bowl or cup sit until cool enough to eat or drink. Also, don't crumble bread or crackers in your soup. Lay down all eating implements before you wipe your mouth or take a drink. When wiping your mouth, don't use the napkin as a washcloth. 
Never sip a beverage until your mouth is empty and has been wiped with the napkin. Sisters, carry a tissue in your purse or pocket so you can blot your lipstick before eating or drinking. It's considered impolite to leave a lipstick ring on a glass. When drinking beverages, sip them slowly. Don't slurp or gulp. If you're using a straw, leave a small amount of beverage in the glass to avoid the noise of drying up air. Always wait for food to be passed or ask for it politely. Never reach across the table. Always pass the salt and pepper as a pair, even if only one is asked for. When cutting meat, don't cut all the meat at once. Cut only one or two bite-sized pieces at a time. Eat them and then cut one or two more small pieces. Always eat chicken, even fried, with knife and fork. Food should be eaten with your fingers only in intimate, family-type settings, on picnics or with permission of your host. Even a deviled egg should be eaten with a fork unless your hostess gives you permission to use your fingers. Never salt and pepper food until you have first tasted it. This is considered an insult to the cook or host. When eating a baked potato, if you want to eat the skin, cut it up with the potato as you eat. When squeezing a lemon wedge on seafood, pierce the lemon with a fork before squeezing it to prevent the juice from squirting. Then shelter the lemon with one hand. If food is passed which you don't like or with which you aren't familiar, take a small portion of it anyway and say nothing. You may move the food around on the plate to appear interested, but don't say, no thanks, unless you're allergic to something, and then don't say anything. Just take the serving bowl and quietly pass it along. Don't ever say anything negative about the food you're served. Express appreciation and gratitude. The words please and thank you always reflect refinement. When you're eating, chew your food well, quietly and gently, and with your mouth closed. Swallow each mouthful completely before taking more. Never talk with your mouth full. If someone directs a question to you when your mouth is full, wait until much of the food is chewed and eaten before you reply. Be careful not to wave your silverware around while you're talking. Don't chew ice. And don't eat off someone else's plate. Elbows should be kept off the table. At the end of the meal, you may gently rest your hands on the table, wrists leaning on the table's edge. If you spill food during the meal, quietly retrieve it with any convenient utensil and place it on the side of your plate as inconspicuously as possible. If you feel ill or need to go to the bathroom, just say, please excuse me for a moment, and leave your napkin on your chair. No apologies or explanation are needed, but after the meal, explain the situation to your hostess. If you need to sneeze, you may sneeze into your napkin if you cannot reach your handkerchief in time, but always turn your head to the side away from the table when sneezing or coughing. Never blow your nose at the table. In some Eastern cultures, burping at the table is considered appropriate. In Western cultures, it is not. If you need to burp, cover your nose and mouth with the napkin to muffle the sound, then say, excuse me, to no one in particular. When eating, be careful not to scrape your upper teeth on your fork. Also, avoid scraping any silverware against your plate. To remove food from your mouth, do it discreetly by using a spoon or paper napkin. An olive pit may be removed with your fingers. Simply place the pit or chewed food on the side of your plate. At the meal's end, don't clean the plate by wiping it with your bread or scraping it with your fork. It is acceptable to use a small bit of bread to help push a last piece of food onto your fork, but do it inconspicuously. And never push food with your fingers or lick your fingers. When you are finished eating, place utensils at an angle across the top of your plate with the knife blade facing in. Refold your napkin casually and place it beside your plate. Don't crumple up your napkin and throw it on top of the plate. And don't push your plate away or your chair back to show that you're through with the meal. When leaving the table, get up from the left and replace your chair. Always offer to help clear the table, but don't automatically get up and take your plate to the sink. 
Your host or hostess may not want you in the kitchen. When at the dinner table, never do anything which would detract from the pleasantness of the occasion. That means no combing hair, filing or cleaning fingernails, and never clean your teeth at the table with a toothpick or with your fingers. If your companion has food wedged in his teeth, quietly tell him so he can excuse himself and remove the food in the bathroom. When eating in public, the same guidelines apply with only a few exceptions. Blessing the food verbally in public can be awkward for those around you and can be misunderstood. However, not blessing the food at all may be misunderstood by new members and investigators. A brief silent blessing with bowed head and downcast eyes should not offend anyone. At ward or branch buffet dinners, use proper manners by not piling food on your plate. Going back for seconds is usually allowed, but only by invitation. After being seated, wait until at least two people have been served before starting to eat. At a restaurant, when sitting with a small group, wait until everyone at the table has been served before eating. Also at a restaurant, if you drop food or a utensil, don't pick it up. Simply leave the utensil on the floor and ask for another. If your utensil is dirty, ask to have it replaced. Never wipe off silverware with your napkin. Finally, the most important part of any meal is to express gratitude to your host or hostess. Verbal appreciation is very important, and a written thank you note is always proper. Practice proper table manners with your companion in your own apartment, so when you're in public, your good manners will be natural and spontaneous. Many wonderful missionary moments have come over dinner conversations. By using proper dining etiquette, you will encourage such missionary situations because you will not only increase your self-confidence in dealing with people, but you'll establish trust and credibility with those you meet. Have you ever wondered how you appear in the eyes of others? What do they see? How much more receptive might people be to you and your message if you present yourself in the best possible manner? The purpose of this video is to help you improve your effectiveness visually and socially. When my husband was a mission president, we had a sister serving in our mission who seemed to have no concern for her physical appearance. In fact, because of her lack of grooming, no one wanted to be her companion. But when I talked to her about the importance of cleanliness and appearance, I was surprised to hear her say, I'm here to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to be in a fashion show. Obviously, this sister didn't understand that being our best self is the essence of the gospel. President Spencer W. Kimball wrote, I assure you that all church standards, both those relating to moral conduct and those relating to dress and grooming are the result of intense, prayerful consideration by church leaders. As we review some of these guidelines, be open-minded and ask yourself if any of these reminders apply to you. A basic self-check is to ask yourself, does my clothing reflect the dignity of my calling? Do I have a professional look, conservative and confident? For elders, Dark colors in suits and pants are appropriate. Sisters should wear conservative, subdued colors of low intensity, not too bright. For elders, socks are to be solid colors of either black, dark brown, or dark blue to harmonize with the color of your suit and shoes. And don't wear argyle socks. For sisters, anklets are not to be worn. Also avoid patterned or bright colored hosiery. Sisters, be careful your dresses and skirts are not too long. They should be long enough to cover your knees when you're seated, but not longer than mid-calf when standing. Skirts which are too long can usually be hemmed up easily. Also, be careful of wearing styles that are too casual. Too trendy. too frilly or too overdone. And of course, t-shirts, polo shirts, and golf shirts are not appropriate.
Keep accessories simple, no dangly earrings or fat items, such as large hair bows. Elders wear ties of medium width and of conservative patterns and colors. Shoes should be dark and coordinate with your suit. And of course, shoes should always be polished. The look should be businesslike, not collegiate. In cold weather missions where layering is essential, make sure layers coordinate and maintain that professional look. A hodgepodge appearance is not attractive even if the temperature is cold. A final word on wardrobe. Be cautious about thrift shopping. Sometimes the lowest prices might mean the lowest quality too. Low quality items do not always launder or fit as well as they should. Shop for the best value, not necessarily the best price. If you have any questions concerning the appropriateness of your wardrobe items, don't hesitate to check with your mission president because your proper appearance is vital to mission success. As we review standards of appearance, we should also reflect on our own personal habits of hygiene and grooming. In warm weather missions especially, missionaries must take even greater care to keep themselves well-groomed and presentable. Ask yourself these basics. Do I wash and bathe frequently, using deodorant regularly? Are my clothes clean, mended, and well-pressed? Do my hair and nails reflect cleanliness and grooming? Does my haircut conform with a businessman's appearance? Do I use sunscreen each day to avoid skin damage or illness? Good sunscreens which do not cause acne are now available. Do I practice good dental hygiene? Does my breath smell fresh and unoffensive? An additional checklist for sisters might include these questions. Is my hosiery free from runs? Are my shoes in good repair? Is my purse clean and uncluttered? Elders, you might ask, are my shirts pressed, shoes shined, and clothing mended and laundered regularly? If you have concerns about care of clothing, such as mending, pressing, or laundering, ask for help from your mission president or refer to the video, Care of Clothing. Now that we have briefly addressed proper wardrobe and grooming, let's consider another very important area, visual and social poise. Visual poise means how we actually appear to others. It starts with good posture and an alert, cheerful countenance. Good posture means stomach muscles in, back and shoulders straight and head up. Good posture not only makes us appear confident, but feel confident as well. A sincere smile, eye contact, and a firm handshake communicate that we care. Handshakes should be a straight-handed clasp solid but not too firm, like this, not this, or this. Sometimes when we get nervous, we tend to display nervous habits which can distract from our message. We may not even be aware we are doing them. Evaluate yourself for any such habits and ask your companion to let you know if he or she notices nervous habits which can be corrected. One bad habit which should always be avoided is gum chewing. Can anything good be said about how a person looks while chewing gum? If visual poise is how we appear, social poise is how we act. One of the most important things you can do is to be genuinely interested in the people you meet and make them feel comfortable with you. That means saying the first kind word, asking them about themselves, and then really listening to what they have to say. Always remember to say please and thank you and to show appreciation for any kindness given you. These are words often overlooked. Thank you notes take so little time and mean so much. Always write thank you notes to the doctors who attend you. And what about introductions when meeting people? When introducing yourself, all you really need to say is, Hello, I'm Sister Brown, and you are? Then you might engage in a short conversation by asking a question or two. And don't forget the rules of introduction. Introduce women to men. Sister Jones, this is Brother Smith. Introduce an older woman or man to a younger one. Sister Jones, I'd like you to meet Sally Brown. Or Brother Smith, this is Elder Green. 
When taking investigators to church, be sure to introduce them to several friendly members so they'll feel like they have friends and they're a part of the group. Also, try especially hard to remember names. Listen carefully when you meet a person. If you should forget a name, simply say, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Then be sure to listen carefully so you'll remember the next time. And finally, a very important aspect of social poise is being able to handle yourself in an awkward situation. You just may find yourself saying a wrong word, spilling food at dinner, or doing something else that might embarrass you. What do you do? Don't overreact. Just pause, take a deep breath, think of the kindest thing you might do or say for all concerned, and do it. Be gracious, apologize if necessary, and maintain your good sense of humor, but don't dwell on the incident. Another situation which can be awkward for missionaries deals with animals and family pets. Getting attacked by a dog is a situation which can be not only frightening, but dangerous. While different opinions exist about what to actually do, ranging from speaking in friendly tones to the dog to saying no in a very low, firm, and authoritarian voice. The thing not to do is to run. And under no circumstances should you kick at the animal. Stand still and assume an extremely confident, in control air. Often this will disarm the animal and it will be less aggressive. When visiting homes, keep in mind that many people look at a family pet as a family member, even as another child. Be as kind to the family's pets as you are to them. One of the difficulties that I had on my mission was that I was allergic to cats. And sometimes the people we visited, they wanted me to hold their pet. Well, I just learned to admire the pet and just very gently explain the situation. Also, a story about my son, a former missionary from Oregon, um, was invited back into a family's home after a year of them not even wanting anything to do with the missionaries because a former missionary had kicked their dog and had said, if it comes near me again, I'll kick it again. And of course, you know, that's not to be done in the mission field. It's hard to believe it was. So after a year, they invited the missionaries back and I believe they were baptized. If you get dog or cat hair on your clothing, say nothing to the family and don't brush it off in front of them. But later in your apartment, simply lift the hair off with a piece of masking tape. Remember that as we refine ourselves through our appearance and conduct, we'll reflect modesty and dignity. It's proper to care about how we look and act so that we'll be radiant and impressive examples of the gospel. sisters in the gospel, we should maintain a feminine dignity no matter where we are or what we're doing. Check yourself in the mirror to make sure you're standing straight. Then as you go throughout the day, remember good posture and stand tall. Most of the time as a missionary, you'll be carrying books, but when your arms are free, stand with them resting on your hip bones or relaxed at your side with the elbows close to the body. If you feel comfortable standing with your arms folded, be sure to let your fingertips show. Otherwise, your arms will pull you into a slump. When putting your hands in your pockets, let the thumb show so it doesn't appear as if you are resting in your pockets. When sitting, practice the following technique. It'll help you look more refined and ladylike. As you approach a chair, turn on the balls of your feet and back up to the chair, touching it with your calves. Then, keeping your back straight, lower yourself to the edge of the chair, then slide back into it. When arising, let your knees do the work, sliding you to the edge and back up in one motion. When you're sitting, it's most attractive to keep your hands together, palms down, or with fingers interlocked in front of you or off to the side, whichever is most natural for you. When sitting, the most important thing to do is keep your knees together. One mission president had to make the front row at meetings off limits to sisters because they couldn't sit modestly. Don't let that be said of you. Keep knees together with your skirt close to your legs. Your feet can be parallel in front of you or at an angle 
or in a model stance with one slightly in front of the other. If you cross your ankles, don't wrap your foot around your leg like this. When you cross your legs, don't cross them at the knees, but at the calves with the top leg resting on the bottom leg at an angle. When sitting, use good posture. Don't use armrests. You tend to either slump or grab onto them. And how about bending over? Never bend from the waist for two good reasons, your front and your back. Rather, lower your body to a sitting position and back up again, keeping the spine as straight as possible. When kneeling to pray, use the same principle. Lower yourself as in bending, then with your knees together, let one come down first. When getting up, make sure your skirt is not caught on your shoes, then rock back onto your feet and come up in one motion. If a chair is close by, use it to help you get up. What about getting in and out of cars? The principles are similar to those of sitting. Back up to the seat, then keeping your knees together, sit on the edge of the seat. Now, keeping your knees together, swing your legs around into the car and then position yourself on the seat. When getting out of the car, remember both legs swing out first with knees together, then use your arms to gently push yourself up and out of the car. And getting in the back of a two-door car, back into the seat, putting one leg in the car and keeping knees together. Then lower yourself in, pulling the other leg in. When getting out, stretch one leg out first, knees together, then gently pull yourself out. Finally, practice good visual poise by having a smooth, confident walk. If you walk too stiff-legged, you'll have a jerkiness or a bounce to your walk. Keep your knees relaxed and bent slightly so your walk is smooth and poised. As you practice walking this way, you'll also find your legs and feet don't get as tired. No matter how confident you are, poor habits of visual poise can make you appear unsure of yourself. So practice good visual poise. As sisters in the gospel, we know that modesty is more than dress. It means how we act and how we talk. It means using soft, gentle tones and avoiding loud laughter and boisterous actions. As sister missionaries, you can set the tone of modesty and graciousness for the entire mission. As you continue to be sensitive to those around you and to your own habits of visual poise, you can become even more effective in your missionary efforts. This video discusses appropriate care of clothing for missionaries. Proper care of your missionary wardrobe will help you look well-groomed and credible. It will also save you time and money since your clothes will last longer. Caring for ourselves and our clothing also gives us greater confidence. We feel more at ease and are more able to forget ourselves and turn out to others. So a few reminders. Keep your clothes clean and fresh smelling. Launder socks, hosiery, lingerie, garments, blouses, and shirts after each wearing. Store soil clothing in a well-ventilated container, preferably without a lid to avoid musty odors or mildew. Launder clothing of similar fabric according to color. Darks together, lights together. Washing dark colors with whites may eventually make the lighter color take on a gray cast. Pre-spot and soak items before laundering if needed. Stubborn stains such as ring around the collar can easily be removed by applying a small amount of this solution before laundering. One half cup ammonia, one half cup Tide, and one pint water. Mix well and rub on stains before washing. Remove stains and spots as soon as possible. Powdered spray spot remover for dry cleaning can be purchased to save on cleaning expenses but always test spot removers on the inside of a hemline or seam to make sure they won't fade color or leave a ring. To remove perspiration odors from jackets or other clothing which must be dry cleaned, make a baking soda paste with a little water and rub under the arm of the suit jacket or dress. Let dry, then rub off. 
For machine or hand washables, try these techniques for spot removal. For mud, let it dry first, then brush or rub vigorously, then launder with soap and water. Blood, rinse immediately with cold water until spot is gone, then launder. Ballpoint pen, use rubbing alcohol or hairspray. Gum, place ice cubes on the spot, then chip off the gum and launder. Fruit or berry stains, wash in hot, hot water. Grass stains, use shampoo or the Tide ammonia water solution. Scorch from the iron, sponge the spot with peroxide, then launder. For mildew, apply vinegar and baking soda or lemon juice, then place in the sun to dry. When hanging any wet articles after laundering, avoid rusty hangers. Use plastic or wood hangers for drip drying. For sisters, when hand washing hosiery, lay them on a clean towel, roll up the towel and gently wring. Then hang hosiery to dry. Stockings will dry twice as fast using this method. When washing sweaters or delicate items, use cool water and dishwashing liquid. Dry on towels. Wrinkles in some garments may be removed simply by hanging them near a steaming shower or bath. Always hang up your clothing when you take it off. This will save a great deal of pressing and will make fibers last longer. When hanging clothing in a closet, try not to crowd the items. This will also eliminate unnecessary ironing. To iron a shirt, follow this procedure. Hello, I'm Sister Beeman, and I'd like to show you some tips for making sure your clothing is ironed properly. Remember, even wash and wear items need a touch-up. First, check the label in your clothing to make sure the temperature of the iron is correct. Cottons will need a fairly hot iron. But rayon and silks may be ruined if the iron is too hot, so be careful. Before you turn on the iron, check to make sure there's no soil on the bottom which could get onto your clothing. Then after the iron is hot, test in an obscure spot to make sure you don't ruin your garment. If you feel a drag on the iron, pick it up quickly and adjust the temperature. Spray starch will give a better finish to your ironing. But be sure to clean spray starch off the iron after it has cooled. Dried on spray starch may leave a brown scorch mark on your shirt the next time. To iron a shirt or blouse, the order depends on what's most comfortable for you, but generally this order works well. Iron the big portion first, then the sleeves, then the yoke, then the collar. When ironing the front of the shirt, be diligent about getting the area around the buttons pressed nicely. Fit the tip of the iron in and around each button, being careful not to melt the buttons. Sometimes it works best to iron the underside of the button area as well. Now press the rest of the front of the shirt. Next comes the back of the shirt. Lay the shirt as flat as possible with the edge of the ironing board pressed against the corners and seams of the shirt. This will help push out the wrinkles for the iron. Move the shirt from one side to the other to press the back. Always move the shirt away from you as you iron so you won't wrinkle the shirt if you accidentally lean against it. On each section, try to be especially diligent on the seams. Now iron the other side of the front of the shirt. Next comes the sleeves. Iron the cuffs first. Then adjust the sleeve, making sure the seam is in the right place. Push the tip of the iron firmly into corners and seams to get a professional look. If wrinkles aren't disappearing, perhaps the iron isn't quite hot enough. Or maybe you need a little more moisture, either steam or spray starch sprayed on the area. Next, iron the yoke, smoothing the fabric as you go. 
Last, do the collar, laying it flat on the ironing board. Iron one side, then flip it over and iron the other side, ironing the collar away from the points so there are no wrinkles at the points. If you don't have access to an ironing board, lay a towel, double folded, on a desk or on the floor. Before ironing, check to make sure the towel is thick enough so heat from the iron will not go through and damage the floor or desk. Now follow the same procedures for ironing a shirt, just doing the best you can at corners and seams. Remember, whether ironing on a towel or on a board, always leave the iron in an upright position as you pause to reposition the shirt. Leaving the iron face down, even for a few moments, may scorch the surface and be transferred to your shirt. Or if you forget about the iron, it may cause a fire hazard. Finally, and most important, when you have completed ironing your shirt, remember to turn off the iron. Also, be sure to unplug the iron as a backup safety measure. If you won't be wearing the shirt right away, hang it up immediately. If your jacket or coat gets soaked in rain or snow, hang it up to dry in a well-ventilated area but away from stoves or heat vents and not in a closet. Stuff wet shoes with crinkled newspaper to absorb moisture and help the shoes keep their shape. Then dry them away from the heat. Be sure to keep your shoes in good condition at all times. That means keeping them shined and in good repair. Replacing worn down heels in the early stages at a shoe repair shop can save money and shoes. Elders, clean, brush, polish, and shine your shoes often. Inspect them daily to make sure they're shiny and free of dust. Sisters, remove any scuffs or scratches with a soft rag dampened with a small amount of dish soap. Gently rub off the scuff marks, then polish as needed. At night, place your shoes where they can air out well. Stuffing them with crinkled paper will absorb excess perspiration if needed. Treating your clothing carefully will be a great advantage to you on your mission. Thoughtful care of your wardrobe will not only save you time, energy, and money, but will ensure that you always look appropriate and well-groomed. Keeping a clean, orderly apartment is an important missionary responsibility. As we surround ourselves with order and cleanliness, the Spirit can dwell with us in even greater abundance. We enjoy greater peace of mind, and we increase the comfort and safety of our surroundings. Let's review some guidelines for apartment cleanliness. You're probably already doing many of these things, but make a mental checklist and recommit to areas which need improvement. First, daily routines. Make your bed as soon as you get out of it. Hello, I'm Sister Beeman. I'm going to give you a few tips about how to make your bed in the morning. The first thing you have to do is be sure that the, the sheet and the blanket's tucked in tightly at the bottom. If you kick it out at night, you have to take care of that first. Then you just smooth the bottom sheet up and out away from the center. Then pull the top sheet up, pull it tightly up and out toward the center, smoothing the wrinkles as you go. Then the blanket, and do the same thing. Just pull it up so it's nice and tight. And then over to the side tightly, work your way down to the bottom. You see, we're doing all on one side first. I'm going to pull the bedspread up here a little bit. You know, I used to hate making my bed in the morning. I just thought it was such a chore. But one morning I timed myself, and it only took me three minutes. So I thought, I could, I could stand that. <laughs> Couldn't be too bad if it only took three minutes. So you just pull it up so that it's tight, smooth out the wrinkles. Didn't take very long, did it? I think you can do that, too. 
hang up towels and washcloths so they can stay clean and dry for the next use. Clean the bathtub each time you use it. Use a tissue to remove any hair left in the bathroom sink or on the counter. Put books and personal items where they belong and where you can find them easily. After meals, wash dishes immediately. Put away food and wipe up crumbs and spills. This habit is not only important for preventing illnesses, but will also save you from having a major cleanup later. Remember to wash out the dishcloth and hang it to dry so it won't sour or mildew. Hang up your clothes as you remove them. This eliminates additional pressing and helps existing wrinkles fall out. It also makes clothing fibers last longer and it will definitely enhance your relationship with your companion as you do your part in keeping your apartment tidy and straight. Before you go to bed each night, take a few minutes to clean up your apartment, especially your bedroom, so you can arise to order and cleanliness. These daily habits of cleanliness will help you and your companion feel better about yourselves, about each other, and about the work ahead. Second, let's consider weekly routines. On your preparation day, accomplish the following tasks. In the bedroom area, change sheets and pillowcases at least weekly. If you are not using bed linens, purchase them. Not using sheets or pillowcases or sleeping on dirty ones can cause skin problems and other hygiene concerns. Sheets which are clean and fresh contribute to a more restful sleep, which of course can make you more effective during daytime hours. One of the nice things about Preparation Day, it gives you a chance to make your bed with nice, clean bedding. You feel renewed when you get into your clean bed. Notice that I'm going from corner to the opposite corner to tuck in this fitted sheet first. And you can just tuck it in as you go so that it's fitting nice and tightly without wrinkles. Give it a good push there as you tuck under. Then you can do the top sheet. The smooth part of the hem should be toward the inside of the bed. Come down to the foot of the bed and make sure that you have enough margin here that you can tuck it in well. And I just guide on the fold line for the center here. Tuck that in all the way across. And then put the blanket on. I've left quite a good margin at the top here too so that it can be folded down over the blanket. I'm going to tuck this in tightly across the bottom. Then on the corner here, I want to show you how to make a square corner. Just pull this out even. Fold it back like this, tuck the bottom part in, fold it back down, and tuck in there. You have a nice square corner. Some people like to tuck it in all the way up. I prefer having it loose. Let's get this corner over here. Nice square corner again. Smooth it out. Make sure you have the blanket all nice and smooth. Then we're going to fold back this edge of the sheet here. It feels a lot nicer to have that sheet next to your chin than the blanket. Then we just put on the bedspread, the pillow, and it's done for the week. Make sure all clothing is either hung neatly in your closet or is folded and put in drawers out of sight. Straighten dressers and bookshelves. Dust thoroughly. Desks, shelves, window ledges, light fixtures, and even above doors. Dust is one of the major causes of allergy problems. Vacuum window hangings and floors. Clean windows inside and out. Sparkling windows will create a more cheerful atmosphere and make you feel uplifted. Next, in the bathroom. Scrub the tub and shower with a good cleanser such as Comet. Give your bathtub an occasional bleaching by filling the tub with water and chlorine bleach. 
Let the mixture sit for 20 minutes before draining and rinsing. Chlorine bleach will also kill mildew and lighten stains. To clean the toilet, lift the lid and scrub with cleanser or with a soda and salt solution. Clean the inside of the bowl as well as where the lid fastens to the form. Then clean the lid itself and the entire stool, including the bolts which fasten it to the floor. Occasionally clean with Lysol to disinfect. If the toilet is badly stained, pour chlorine bleach into the bowl and leave it for a few hours or overnight. Wipe down the shower curtain. If it is slick with soap buildup or mildew, take it down and scrub it with a Tide and water solution. Clean the bathroom sink with cleanser, paying attention to mildew which may be around the faucet and fixtures. Use a paper towel to polish the chrome. Clean around light fixtures. Spot clean walls weekly, paying particular attention to mop boards, door frames, light switches, and doorknob areas. Clean the mirror with window cleaner or ammonia water. Dry with paper towels to prevent streaking. Be sure to shake or launder any throw rugs as needed. Sweep or vacuum the bathroom floor and then mop with warm water mixed with Tide, Pine Sol, or another all-purpose cleaner. And last, don't forget to hang clean towels. Next, let's move on to the kitchen area. First, wash, dry, and put away any dirty dishes. Then dispose of all garbage. Wash down counters with Tide and water solution, paying close attention to any tiles or grooved areas around the sink, stove, or oven. Clean the oven thoroughly once a week. If you wipe up spills after each use throughout the week, this weekly cleaning will not take long. Setting a dish of ammonia in the oven with the door closed overnight will loosen burned on food. If you can't easily wipe off food the next day, use oven cleaner, but three cautions. Follow the directions carefully, wear rubber gloves, and open a window or door so the kitchen is well ventilated. After the oven is clean, place foil on the bottom under the heat element to catch future spills. When cleaning stove elements, a crumpled up piece of foil can work as a cleaning pad, but don't use foil on stainless steel. It may scratch the surface. When cleaning the refrigerator, check open cartons for expiration dates, especially dairy products. Discard any products which may be old or contaminated. If you think a food item has gone bad, check its color and smell, but don't taste it. When in doubt, throw it out. Food poisoning can be dangerous. Wash out the refrigerator at least once a month with a mixture of soda and water or Tide water, then rinse well. Wipe down the inside door. Remove drawers and shelves and wash spills. If you have an older refrigerator which is not self-defrosting, turn off the unit and remove everything from it. Place a pan of boiling water in the freezer compartment and shut the freezer door. Then as ice thaws, Remove it in chunks, wiping any spills in back of the refrigerator. After the freezer unit is free of ice, dry it with a paper towel before turning the refrigerator back on. This will keep the moisture on freezer walls from turning into ice so quickly. Replace food, drawers, and shelves, and then wipe down the exterior door of the refrigerator as well as the top. Keep an open box of baking soda in your refrigerator to absorb odors. Other items to remember in kitchen cleaning are keep cabinets tidy and orderly, taking weekly inventory of needs. Empty crumbs from the toaster to prevent fire hazards. Unplug the toaster first and then dump the crumbs. Never put a utensil inside the toaster. Gather dirty dish towels and cloths and launder them weekly. Sweep the kitchen floor daily and mop weekly or as needed. Tide and water make an excellent cleaning solution. Other good all-purpose cleaning agents are available at your grocery store. Just remember, read directions carefully before using. 
and never mix ammonia products with chlorine products. The fumes can be very dangerous. If you have a living room or dining room area, use the same basic techniques of good cleaning. Remember, dusting, vacuuming, and regular general cleaning discourages allergies, insects, and germs. Missionaries should regard their apartments as their homes, keeping them clean and in good repair. As we turn these routines of cleanliness into daily and weekly good habits, our spirits will lift, our attitudes will brighten, and our minds will be free to focus even more on our missionary efforts. We all know how difficult it is to serve others when we're ill or not feeling well. How true that is for missionary work as well. Proper fitness and good nutrition is important to missionary service. If we're tired or run down, we may find it difficult to function with the energy and enthusiasm we need, or to radiate sincere feelings of love and caring to those around us. Poor nutrition and fitness habits show up not only in our eyes, skin, hair, and posture, but in our mental attitude as well. Having vitality and good health as a missionary doesn't come by accident. It comes by accepting responsibility for our own health needs. That means eating the right foods and drinking plenty of water, getting enough sleep and exercise, properly taking any prescribed medication, practicing proper hygiene, and having a positive mental attitude. Now let's take a closer look at these principles. First, eating the right foods. Eat a well-balanced diet, including fruits, vegetables, and grains. Limit foods which are high in sugar, fats, and salt, as well as those having little nutritional value. Eat in moderation, and include variety in your menus. As missionaries, eating dinner at members' homes does limit your ability to be in total control of your diet, but you can be in control of the portions you take. Also, it is appropriate to talk to your host or hostess about any diet restrictions or weight control concerns, but this should be done well in advance of dinner appointments. Be careful never to offend anyone by criticizing food being served or by refusing to take certain items. Take smaller portions so you'll have room for all the courses which have been prepared. Always be appreciative and grateful. Then, when in your own apartments, be sure to follow guidelines of good nutrition. Don't skip meals. Breakfast gives you a head start on the day, and lunch keeps your energies up until dinner. Make sure your menus include protein, the building blocks for the body, found in fish, meat, poultry, dairy products, grains, peas, and beans. Carbohydrates, which provide our bodies with accessible energy. Primary sources are grains and starchy vegetables, such as potatoes. Fats, which provide our bodies with stored energy. This includes meats, dairy products, and vegetable oils. And vitamins and minerals, important for the normal functioning of all our body systems. These are found in dairy products, fruits, vegetables, and meats. A good breakfast might include such items as juice, milk, fresh fruit, whole grain toast, cereal, or pancakes. Be careful not to eat cold cereals which are full of sugar. Shredded wheat is a good non-sugar cold cereal. Oatmeal is an excellent hot cereal. Nutritious lunches might include sandwiches, salads, soups, fruit, whole grain bread, pasta, or vegetables. Eat foods you like, but learn to like foods that will supply your nutritional needs. Also, drink plenty of water, eight to 10 glasses a day. This is a very important part of good nutrition, especially in warmer climates. During hot summer months, a person can become dehydrated quite rapidly. Signs of dehydration or heat exhaustion include weakness, dizziness, nausea, headache, and even chills. Get in the habit of drinking water often, even if you don't feel thirsty. Water is essential to carrying nutrients through our body 
and to eliminate waste. Water also keeps us refreshed and revitalized. Sometimes excessive perspiration in warm weather depletes potassium in our bodies. A glass of orange juice or a banana will give a quick pickup and restore needed potassium. The second step to good health is to get enough rest and exercise. One of the biggest problems for missionaries is that they don't get to bed on time. Getting to bed by 10.30 every night will enable you to arise by the appropriate time of 6.30 the next morning. Follow missionary guidelines in your handbook. Don't slight missionary work by sleeping too long or too little. Also, remember that exercise is important but should not be overdone. 20 consecutive minutes a day is usually sufficient for elevating your heart rate long enough to give you an aerobic workout. Exercise when you first get up in the morning. Running in place in your apartment and jumping rope are all good exercises, providing, of course, you don't live in an upstairs apartment. Be careful not to be a noisy neighbor. The concern is on building endurance, not on building muscles. Weightlifting is not encouraged. Barbells should be sent home. And of course, working out at health spas is not acceptable. If you have questions about appropriate exercise, talk to your mission president. Also, if you are on an exercise program prescribed by your doctor, be sure to discuss it with your mission president. Third, be diligent in taking any medications prescribed by your doctor. If you are on iron, thyroid, diabetes medication, antibiotics, or any other medicine, be consistent and conscientious in taking it exactly as directed by your doctor. Remember, there are no shortcuts to good health. Fourth, practice proper hygiene. Take a bath every day and use deodorant. That applies to all missionaries, elders or sisters. Wash your hands frequently, especially before handling food or eating meals. Keep your hair shampooed frequently and nails trimmed and clean. Floss and brush teeth regularly so your teeth will be healthy and your breath fresh. And use mouthwash. Wear clean clothing every day, especially clean socks and clean hosiery. Keep your outer clothing well pressed and make sure your shoes are clean and polished. Practice good posture. Take pride in your grooming and appearance. And the fifth guideline for good health, have a good mental attitude. Constant negative emotions such as worry, anger, resentment, or frustration can greatly damage your physical and emotional well-being. Research shows that negative thoughts can actually weaken your immune system and make you physically ill. Replace fear with faith and negative thoughts with positive, cheerful, loving ones. Be grateful. Nothing elevates our state of mind like counting our blessings and expressing gratitude for them. Practice daily these five principles of good health. Eating the right foods and drinking plenty of water. Getting adequate sleep and regular exercise. Taking prescribed medications diligently. Practicing proper hygiene. And having a positive mental attitude. Fitness is a key to effective missionary work. Research shows there is a direct relationship between our physical health, our work productivity, and our spiritual development. If you have any problems regarding health or fitness matters, talk with your mission president. For as you take control of your own physical and mental well-being, you'll increase your effectiveness as a missionary and your joy in serving. Call to serve Him, Heavenly King of Glory, chosen heir to witness for His name. Far and wide we tell the Father's story.